Okay. So today's lecture is going to be on chapter 16, the frontal lobes. <coughs> A quick outline of what we'll go over today is frontal lobe anatomy, theory of frontal lobe function, symptoms of frontal lobe lesions, intelligence in the frontal lobes, imaging frontal lobe function, and finally, disorders affecting the frontal lobe. So I wanted to read through the portrait that we have at the beginning of each chapter. Um, it gives a good overview of losing frontal lobe functions. So it talks about <clears throat> E.L., um, a professor at an upstate New York college. He was late in the spring semester when he was around 60 years old and he started having these headaches and felt like maybe he had the flu, but after a few days of rest, he wasn't getting any better like he typically would from the flu or a headache. Um, he eventually went to the doctor who determined he had an infection in the left frontal lobe and the source was really difficult to identify. So he started developing these cognitive symptoms and found um, his wife found it really worrisome. He seemed disorganized as I think I mentioned this before. He was he was known for his organizational skills, if I didn't say that at the beginning. Um, so now that's quite the opposite. He's being very disorganized. He's showing little emotion. Um, he never missed any deadlines before and he was coming up um, on a chapter deadline for a book that he was writing and he just couldn't think of anything to write. He went to a neuropsychological assessment um, and the most striking thing it says about EL was the, his flat affect and virtual absence of any facial expression. So these are symptoms typical of left frontal lobe patients. And the lack of affect was not associated with the lack of effort on the test because his intelligence um, and general memory scores ranked in the superior range. So he did register some impairments on tests that were sensitive to frontal lobe functions. Um, talking with EO and his wife of more than 30 years made it clear that he was having difficulty not only with his academics and his work, but also his social interactions with his colleagues, friends, and family. Um, he found it very difficult to interact even with his closest friends. And his wife started getting concerned that her husband was, quote unquote, not the man she married. So let's see. Yeah, this case example just gives an overview of some of the functions the frontal lobes are responsible for, and we'll go more in depth of those throughout the lecture. Um, so for now, to get a generic idea of the frontal lobe functions, um, <clears throat> The book mentions how we all have these stories about goofing up or behaving inappropriately, but it makes an important distinction that most of us don't do those types, you know, that make those types of errors or have those types of behaviors very often. Um, that's because our frontal lobes control our behavior with respect to time and place. Um, it can perform these functions only if provided with all the sensory and memory information it needs. Meaning basically we're able to tailor how we act in various situations based on social and environmental cues, cues excuse me, thanks to our frontal lobes. Okay. So the frontal lobe contains all the tissue anterior to the central sulcus, the portion lit up on your left on the screen there in the picture of the brain, um, the orange pinkish color here. So we'll start by going over the four subdivisions of the frontal cortex, which are the primary motor cortex, the premotor cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the anterior cingulate cortex. As we go through these first slides, we'll mainly focus on the anatomy of them and then we'll get to their function, functions later in the lecture. So the primary motor cortex, M1, let's see if my mouse will show up. Um, it can be seen as that light blue area four here. Okay. 
in the human brain on those figures shown. So the primary motor cortex, PMC, if I refer to it as that, same thing, um, it specifies elementary movements such as those of the mouth and limbs. So this area controls movement force and direction. So which way you move your arm and at what rate of speed, how forceful you are with the movement, things like that. <clears throat> then immediately anterior to the motor cortex, the premotor cortex, PM, is made up of areas 6, 8, and 44. So right here, 6, these 8 areas, and 44. 44, which is Broca's area. So the green and the orange, and then on the lateral view, um, you can see 44 in the purple here. <clears throat> My mouse will cooperate, right? Okay. The premotor cortex includes a dorsal region called the supplementary motor cortex, and lying below it, the three major premotor sectors, which are the dorsal, the ventral, premotor cortex and the inferior frontal gyrus, which is also in Broca's area. Let's see. The dorsal premotor cortex works to choose movements from its own movement lexicon, so from this bank of movements to choose from. And then the ventral premotor cortex contains mirror neurons that recognize others' movements and select similar or different actions, as does Broca's area. The premotor areas can influence movements either directly or indirectly. Um, regions that control eye movement also send signals to these regions, and all of the premotor areas receive projections from the dorsolateral prefrontal cor cortex. Um, really implicating this area in controlling limb and eye movements. Okay. The prefrontal cortex. Oops, sorry. There we go. This is a major participant in networks involved in emotional behaviors. So PFC, prefrontal cortex, is the area anterior to the motor, premotor, and cingulate cortex. So right here, this part. It plays um, an important role in regulating how our prefrontal neurons are rea reacting to stimuli, and this includes any stressful stimuli, which is likely why it contributes to our emotional states. Um, abnormalities in this projection play roles in developing schizophrenia as well as drug addiction. Okay. There are three regions of the prefrontal cortex. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is areas 99 and 46. Um, I think you can see that on, they're not labeled here, but page, let's see. 430 of the book, if I'm not mistaken, I have a note there. Um, the next one is the orbitofrontal cortex, which is areas 47 and lateral portions of 11, 12, and 13. And then the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is Broadman's area, 10, 14, and 25, and then some medial parts also of 11, 12, and 13, and then an anterior part of 32. Finally, the anterior cingulate cortex. It also includes Rodman's area, um, 24 and part of 32. As you can see here, it's a little blurry, but 24, this light red here, and then part of 32, the blue directly to the left and a little bit down from it. Um, this area is a more recent evolutionary development and you can think of it as a specialized neocortex. It makes extensive bidirectional connections with motor, premotor, and prefrontal cortex. Okay. All right. 
So the frontal lobe regions are central to many cortical networks. So those on the outer layer of the cerebrum. Um, there's the brain's default network, which um, you can think of default as working when people are at rest. However, uh, this is a misnomer because the default network is also active during directed tasks, such as thinking about the past, thinking about the future, and even when your mind is wandering. There's also the brain's salience network. Um, it's most active when a behavioral change is needed and it operates to modulate other networks activities. Um, if it's not functioning the way it's supposed to, the default network shows excessive activity. So kind of picking up the slack, so to speak, um, which can lead to lapses in attention. Okay. So what does all of that really mean? Because I had to really dig into it, um, this part of it before fully understanding those first few slides. So thank you for sticking with me through that part. It's not the most natural um, to pick up on. So let's go through kind of a scenario to help it make sense. It's the dinner party scenario. Um, let's say at the spur of the moment, you invite your friends over for dinner. Um, you realize I don't really have anything to serve them. So I guess I'll go shopping after I leave work which I get off at 5 p.m. Um, before you leave, you prepare a list of items to buy. You're working under a time constraint because you need to get home before your guests arrive and you need time to actually prepare the food you're gonna serve to them. Um, all of the items that you need are not all at the same store, so you have to plan an efficient you know, travel route. Um, you also can't get distracted by stores selling other things like really cute pair of shoes you might see on the way. Um, things you don't need to buy in this moment because time is of the essence. Or, you know, if you see a friend in the store, you could, you have to make sure that you're not spending too much time catching up or chatting with them because you have a task at hand. Um, let's see. So, the task you've set yourself, while it may seem a little bit rushed, um, for most people, it's not super challenging. Like, you won't get overly stressed out trying to do this. Um, people with a frontal lobe injury, however, really cannot manage it. The fundamental requirements of the task that challenge frontal lobe patients are the planning, the selecting from all the different options, um, ignoring those outside or extraneous stimuli and just really keeping to the task at hand, um, keeping track of which stores they have gone to already or the ones they still need to go to, the items that they've purchased and the ones that they still need to go buy some from somewhere. So the behavioral requirements um, of this task can be described as the temporal or time organization of behavior and this sort of sequential organization is one of the general functions of the frontal lobe. Um, so that's a big one to, to keep in mind. So the frontal lobe contains control systems that implement these behavioral strategies in response to both internal and external cues. <clears throat> so functions of the premotor cortex specifically, if you consider a dog's resting behavior, um, it may get up and respond to its owner's call, or it may get up and for no real apparent reason to us at all, just wander around the yard. Um, if the dog is responding to its owner's call in response to a specific environmental cue or external cue, um, if the dog gets up and just wanders about on its own, that is in response to an internal event. So basically it just wanted to. The premotor cortex functions primarily select behaviors in response to external cues. So the owner calling the dog. Um, 
the supplementary motor region makes a greater internal contribution when no external cues are available. Um, motor acts are also associated with cues. So for example, um, the second picture here, learning that red means stop and green means go when you're driving in order to remain safe. Um, these colors were arbitrary until paired with the meaning of traffic rules. So when learning these associations, activity, like if you're hooked up to an fMRI, the activity will increase in the premotor cortex area when you're learning those types of associations. Functions of the prefront prefrontal cortex. Um, there's four aspects of movement selection. So before we get into this, just a quick review. The motor cortex is responsible for making movements. The premotor cortex selects the movements. And now the prefrontal cortex controls cognitive processes that select appropriate movements at the correct time and place. So this selection can be controlled um, by internalized information or by external cues, or it can be made in response to context of self-knowledge, um, which is also referred to throughout the chapter as autonoetic, excuse me, autonoetic awareness, self-knowledge. Internal cues um, speaks to, you know, developing rules, quote unquote, that can be used to guide your thoughts and actions. They are independent of existing sensory memory, um, which is called either temporal memory, working memory, or short-term memory. Uh, the book tends to use temporal memory refer referring to neural records of events and their order. External cues. So we all experience some instances of failed temporal organization or being controlled by external rather than internal cues such as when you go, you know, you start to go do something, you get distracted and then you can't remember what you were initially going to do in the first place. It reminds me of, you know, walking into a different room of the house and pausing and not being able to remember why did I even come in here in the first place. Um, so this is more of the external cues example. If your temporal memory is defective, people are dependent on environmental cues to determine their behavior. Um, behavior is controlled directly by external cues. So with the di dinner party example, people with frontal lobe damage would enter the shoe store as they responded to environmental cues, hindering them from completing their task at hand of collecting the items they need before going home in a timely manner to make dinner for their friends. Okay, so Context cues is the next category. Um, I think most people would probably agree that your behavior around, say, your grandparents is somewhat different than your behavior around your high school friends or even your work colleagues. Each rule, or excuse me, each role that we have in life is governed by these certain rules that we're expected to follow. So our behavior varies by environment as well. Um, such as being at the library versus being at the football game. You're going to probably act very differently in those two situations. Behavior that is appropriate in one place or in one moment may prove very inappropriate in a different context. So I just thought these were good visuals to help remember that the funny little girl at the library of course, telling everyone, you know, this is a quiet zone, libraries were supposed to be quiet. And then at a football game, you know, nobody cares if you're quiet, you know, cheer as much as you want, and it's not going to be thought of as unacceptable. So autonomic awareness means self-knowledge or awareness of yourself. It can also be thought of as an autobiographic knowledge. Um, it lets you find together the awareness of yourself as a continuous entity through time. So just like remembering, you know, who you've been through all the years. Impairment in this results in a deficit of behavioral self-regulation, 
Um, so if you take, for example, a salesman who suffered orbitofrontal injury from a TBI, had difficulty maintaining a relationship with his wife of 10 years. He couldn't relate to her. He didn't know why he married her. He tried to tell himself, you know, I must have been happy at some point and to have married this person and everyone else was kind of telling him the same thing that he had been very happy, but he just didn't feel that himself after the injury. Um, so we, we interpret the world from our own frame of reference and you kind of lose that in this type of situation if you, if you incur damage to this area. Let's see. Okay. So asymmetry of frontal lobe function. Um, these are relative rather than absolute in that results from studies of patients with frontal lobe lesions indicate that both frontal lobes play a role in nearly all behavior. So while they are separated into left and right, um, it's not quite as clear cut as, you know, the slide would have it appear with left frontal lobe being related to language related movements, such as speech and the right frontal lobe um, being nonverbal movements like facial expressions. That is where you know, it comes from, but they're more integrated than, than not. Okay, so you can see from the chart here that people with a deficit in the left hemisphere had much more difficulty with verbal fluency tasks than people with a right hemisphere lesion. So this top line right here, if you can see my mouse, um, quite a difference between 70 and 38 here. Whereas those with the right hemisphere lesions had more difficulty um, with a visual task. Where did it go? Block construction is the one I wanted to reference. Um, had more difficulty with the visual task such as block construction, 50, than those with a left hemisphere damage, 10. Okay, so hopefully this is a, still a smooth transition. I did pause recording the lecture for a few minutes to step away. Um, Hopefully that all worked out smoothly and we can pick up and continue where we were. Okay, so heterogeneity of frontal lobe function. Um, when, when you're considering the symptoms of frontal lobe injury, we need to remember that one, any individual is unlikely to show all symptoms. And two, the severity of symptoms will vary with lesion location. Um, there is some evidence that discrete localization of functions exist in the orbitofrontal cortex, but this is really not the main finding. Um, the takeaway here is to remember those two things. Most people don't, aren't going to show every single symptom and that the severe, severity will vary with the location of the lesion. All right. We'll start going through the symptoms of frontal lobe lesions. The first category is going to be disturbances of motor function um, with, sorry, I thought my screen sharing stopped. I hope not. Um, with fine movement speed and strength, movement programming, voluntary gaze, corollary discharge, and speech. So fine movements, speed, and strength. Um, damage to the primary motor cortex, which is area four, is typically associated with a chronic loss of the ability to make fine independent finger movements. Um, in addition, there's a loss of speed and strength in both hand and limb movements in the contralateral limbs. Um, the loss of strength 
isn't merely a symptom of damage to area four because lesions restricted to the prefrontal cortex also can lead to reduced hand strength. As far as movement programming, um, removal of the supplementary motor cortex causes a disruption in almost all voluntary movements, so um, including speech if removal is on the left. Recovery is fairly rapid and the only permanent disability it seems um, appears to be in the performance of rapidly alternating movements with your hands or fingers. So the likely reason that you know such minor symptoms result from such a large you know lesion is that both the left and right premotor cortices contribute to movement programming. Um, so both left and right premotor areas. Um, show an increase in blood flow during unimanual tasks in humans, whereas in monkeys, cells in both the left and right premotor areas show increased activity regardless of which hand is moving. Uh, let's see. There's a study where patients um, with localized unilateral frontal lobectomies were asked to copy a series of arm or facial movements and then they showed mild impairment in copying the arm movements. It was really small compared with the performance of patients with the left parietal lobe lesion. Um, in contrast, patients with both left and right frontal lobe damage were really not good at copying a series of facial movements. The groups with Frontal lobe lesions made more errors um, in sequence than the controls of other groups of patients. So in other words, patients with frontal lobe lesions had difficulty ordering the various components of the sequence into a chain of movements. So it makes sense that kind of the general um, function, one of the general func functions of the frontal lobes is that sequencing. Um, like of the, of the dinner party task that we talked about sequencing. And that way, this is a different type of sequencing, but still a sequence task, um, just related to movement. So they, these particular patients recalled components correctly, but they were in the wrong order. Okay, also the alteration that frontal um, injury really disrupts copying facial, um, but not arm movements, implies that the frontal lobe may play a special role in controlling the face. Um, it can even include the tongue. So if you think back to the case example in the very beginning of the lecture, EL, it makes sense that you know, he exhibited little spontaneous facial expression. He had flat affect. Okay, voluntary gaze. So a number of studies have shown that frontal lobe lesions produce alterations in voluntary eye gaze. So in one study, patients were presented with a screen that had 48 patterns that could be distinguished either by shape, color, or both. Um, the picture here on the slide represents that. They were given a warning signal, um, a duplicate, with, at which point a duplicate of one of the 48 patterns appeared in the box at the center of the array. So here you'll see, um, here you'll see, it just, okay, the red dot, the red circle in the middle would have been um, the only one. And then the, the task is to identify the matching pattern by pointing to it. So they should be able to, to point the red circle on the left-hand side of the picture over here. Patients with frontal lobe lesions were impaired at finding the duplicate. Okay, corollary discharge. 
So, if I'm not showing across the screen. Okay, so we'll just go on. Um, corollary discharge. So, if you push on your eye, your surroundings seem to move. And I uh, don't think I'd ever like consciously done this before or real, you know, thought about why I was doing it if I have rubbed my eye like this. Um, but after reading it or while reading it, I was like trying it out and sure enough, <laughs> it works, of course. Um, so if you push on like the side of your eye, your surroundings seem to move, but if you move your, your eyes, like just shift your gaze from left to right, everything seems to remain still. Uh, that's because moving your eyes generates this neural signal that movement will happen and the world stays still. Um, that signal is called corollary discharge or sometimes reafference. So when you're running, for example, you're out on a jog, the external world, it remains stable even though, you know, your sense organs are in motion, but because the corollary discharge signals um, that the movements are taking place. So a frontal lobe lesion can disrupt movement production and it can also interfere with the message to the rest of the brain that movement is taking place. Speech is the next one, um, is the last one in this category. Speech entails movement selection. So words are responses generated in the context of both internal and external stimuli. If the frontal lobe has a mechanism for selecting responses, then it must select words too. The frontal lobe contains two speech zones, Broca's area or area 44, and the supplementary speech area. Broca's area is critical to retrieving a word based on an object, word, letter, or meaning. So Broca's area selects words based on cues. In contrast, the supplementary speech area is re required to re retrieve words without external cues. Um, so people with strokes in Broca's area are impaired in using verbs or producing the right you know, grammatical um, way of speaking, a symptom known as a grammatism, I wanna say. Sorry if I pronounced these wrong. Um, regardless, people with strokes that include the supplementary speech area um, are often mute. So the ability to speak returns after a few weeks in those with unilateral lesions, but not in those with bilateral lesions. Okay. The next major category of frontal lobe lesions symptoms is loss of divergent thinking, which includes behavioral spontaneity and strategy formation. So one clear difference between the effects of parietal and temporal lobe lesions versus frontal lobe lesions is performance on standard IQ tests. Uh, posterior lesions produce decreases in IQ scores, but frontal lesions do not. So the question could be, you know, why, why patients with frontal lobe damage appear to do such quote unquote stupid things like we kind of talked about at the beginning, we all kind of goof up sometimes. Um, why is this if it doesn't, if these types of lesions in the frontal lobe don't affect our IQ? Um, traditional IQ tests measure what can be called convergent thinking, meaning that there is only one correct answer to each question. So they use traditional IQ tests, they use definitions of words, questions of fact, arithmetic problems, puzzles, block designs, all of these tasks only require and even only allow one single correct answer. Um, they're easily scored that way. Another type of intelligence that emphasizes, um, or intelligence test rather, 
emphasizes the number and variety of responses to a single question rather than a single correct answer. That type is called divergent thinking. So patients with frontal lobe lesions exhibit a loss of spontaneous speech. Um, they're asked to first write or say as many words, starting with a given letter as they can think of in five minutes, and then say as many four letter words starting with a given letter in four minutes. This is the um, Thurston word fluency test or Chicago word fluency test. So patients with frontal lobe lesions have a low world word output on these tests. Um, four features of frontal lobe damage that this can test for are low output, rule breaking, shaky script, so writing, um, and pers perseveration. So there's an example in the book, um, Mrs. P. And let's see. As far as low output, Mrs. P is only eight words beginning with the letter S and six words beginning with the letter C. Those were the two letters that they told her to use um, in this task. Whereas control participants of similar age and education produced about 60 words in the same time frame. So compared to her eight and six. Rule breaking is a common characteristic of these patients. They told Mrs. P several times that the words starting with C could only contain four letters. Um, she replied with responses like, yes, yes, I know. I know I keep using more each time. Um, so clearly she understood the instructions, but she could not organize her behavior in order to follow them. She had shaky scripts, so her writing was kind of jerky. Um, it seemed like kind of like childlike writing, um, implying that the tumor that she had in this, in this particular case had invaded the motor or premotor cortex. And then perseveration, she insisted on talking throughout the test, complaining that she just couldn't think of any more words. She kept looking around the room for objects starting with the letter that they you know, had, had instructed her to use, things like that. So um, while the range of behavior studied has been small, the frontal lobe patients display a general loss of spontaneous behavior. They can appear lethargic or lazy. Um, they can have difficulty getting out of bed, you know, getting dressed, things like that. Okay. Strategy formation. So those with frontal lobe damage are impaired at developing these novel cognitive plans or ways to solve problems on their own. Um, a task example, kind of similar to the dinner party example from before, is that patients were given a list of six, given a list of six errands. Um, for example, buy a loaf of brown bread and an instruction to be at a particular place 15 minutes after starting. They were also to get answers to four questions, such as, you know, what is the price of a pound of tomatoes? Um, they weren't supposed to enter shops except to buy something and were to complete the task as quickly as possible without rushing. Frontal lobe damage patients found this very, very difficult. Um, they were not efficient at this task. They broke rules. So for example, entering the, the shops that they didn't need to go in. Um, and two of the three patients failed at least four of the tasks. So when they were quizzed, all of the patients understood the task and they had attempted to comply. They weren't simply like not trying to do it. Um, so the takeaway from that is, you know, the frontal lobe has a really critical role in coping with novel situations. Okay. The third major category of frontal lobe lesions symptoms is environmental control of behavior, which includes response inhibition, risk-taking and rule-breaking, 
self-regulation, and then associative learning. Okay. Patients with frontal lobe lesions, they consistently perseverate on responses in a variety of test situations, mainly those with changing demands. So the best example can be seen in the Wisconsin card sorting test. This is a standard clinical test of frontal lobe injury where a subject is presented with four stimulus cards bearing designs that differ in color, form, and number of elements. The task at hand is to sort these cards into pals um, in front of one another of the stimulus cards. So the only help given to the subject during this task is to be told whether the choice is correct or incorrect. The test works on the following principle. So the correct solution is first color, and then when the subject has figured that out, um, without warning, the correct solution then becomes form. So the subject must now inhibit classifying the cards based on color and shift over to classifying them based on form. When they've succeeded at you know, selecting by form, the correct solution again changes unexpectedly, this time to the number of elements. So like, you know, sorting them by three dots, three squares, three stars, three diamonds, things like that. Um, let's see. They, they continue, you know, responding to the color for as many as like 100 cards until testing is terminated. Um, throughout the time, they can comment that they know that color is no longer correct. They still have to continue to sort on the basis of color. Um, one person stated, form is probably the correct solution now, so the sorting to color will be wrong, and this will be wrong and wrong again. So they're, they're talking through it, but you remember they aren't given any feedback except for correct or incorrect. Okay, the Stroop test. Um, is another demonstration of loss of response inhibition. So you're presented with this yellow, it looks kind of hard to see, maybe it'll be better on y'all's end, but um, you're presented with a list of color names. Though each name that is written is in a different colored ink than the word that it actually states. So the word yellow written is printed in blue ink or green ink or red ink, but it reads yellow based on the letters. Um, so the task is to name each color, name the color each word it's printed in as quickly as possible. So it takes some effort to look at, you know, to look at, say, this word here and Instinctively, you may want to say purple because you're reading it, you're reading the letters of it, but the task at hand is to say red because it's written in the color red. So patients with left frontal lesions are really unable to not read the words. So they, they continue reading the words. They would say, let's see, blue for the first column, um, second row here, this blue, where they should say green um, instead. Okay, risk taking and rule breaking. So frontal lobe patients are, um, it varies from other neurological patients in their failure to comply with instructions. Um, on tests of learning where a buzzer indicated that the patient had made an error and they were supposed to stop and start over again at the beginning. The subjects with frontal lobe lesions disregarded the signal completely and continued on the incorrect path and continued to make more errors. Um, another task was to guess words on the basis of partial information. So 
with each additional clue they were provided, a subject was assigned um, a success, successively lower point value for a correct answer, but you could only get the points if the answer was correct. So lesser points would make sense to you know, get a couple of clues to make sure that you have the answer correct and then guess it, take your points versus, um, you know, taking the risk of guessing it and getting it incorrect and getting no points at all. Um, frontal lobe patients took more risks and made more mistakes than other patients did. So the risk taking was greatest in frontal lobe patients who also had temporal lobe damage. Finally, subjects were asked to bet, so like a gambling situation, to bet on whether a card was red or blue without any knowledge of the probability that it was red or blue. Uh, brain activity was compared to a condition where they knew that the probability was 50-50. So patients with orbitofrontal lesions did not find the ambiguous task aversive but the control group found it much more aversive than knowing or than the you know, known risk task. So the difference was demonstrated by a higher activation in the controls um, in, of the FC and the amygdala during such an ambiguous risk task. Okay. So back to self-regulation, um, we've spoke briefly on this before, well, mainly that it's related to autonomic awareness. Um, if you take the case example of ML, he had been a salesman, he knew that, um, you know, what his job had been and that he knew that he traveled a lot for his job. However, he was not able to tell a single personal anecdote about his job when asked. Um, if someone asked if he traveled to conferences, he would tell them, yes, he traveled to conferences often. It was a major part of his job, but he couldn't name a single experience he had had at a conference. Um, so his autobiographic knowledge was not there. Um, it may try to help or may help to try to imagine this type of deficit if you think about when you were in high school. So we're all aware of having gone to high school, we can probably describe what the high school was like, what it looked like, you know, things like that. And presumably so could patients like ML. The difference is that we can describe personal events that happened to us in high school um, whereas ML would not be able to do so, similar to not being able to tell you about any, you know, any stories from going to conferences for work. So this kind of sheds some light um, on why he had such difficulty relating to his wife in the previous example. The loss of autobiographic knowledge clearly makes it difficult to put ongoing life events in context and leads to difficulties regulating you know, behavioral flexibility as well. <clears throat> Associative learning. So those with large frontal lobe lesions are basically unable to learn from experiences. Um, it is thought that you know, they, they cannot regulate their behavior in response to external stimuli. Um, so one study examined the ability of both human patients and monkeys with frontal lobe lesions to make arbitrary stimulus response associations. The examiner asked the frontal lobe patients to learn arbitrary associations between colors and hand postures. So similar to those shown here, there were nine of them. Um, let's see. So they were presented with nine colored stimuli and their task was to learn which hand posture was associated with which color, basically. 
Um, we know that it's not a memory issue because temporal lobe patients who had memory issues performed perfectly fine on this task. Um, and in a similar task, patients were able to repeat the instructions and tell which hand was which. Okay, the final major category of frontal lobe lesion symptoms is poor temporal memory, um, which has been studied in both monkeys and in humans. In studies with monkeys, chimpanzees rather, um, the finding is that chimpanzees with frontal lobe lesions are impaired in a delayed response test. So they would observe a reward being placed under a plaque or in a well, and then um, their view would be blocked for a few seconds, and then they're allowed to retrieve the award, reward rather. Um, another example would be that monkeys were presented a task where they were required to open each of 25 doors to obtain a food reward. This is the one kind of shown here through these at the top here through the pictures. Um, so food was placed behind each door once per day. So they had to learn not to return to locations where the reward had already been obtained. So where they'd already gotten it from. Um, they found that lesions in area 46 produced impairments in that. So um, control group monkeys developed a door opening strategy that led to very few repetitions of you know, opening doors that they'd already been to, that there's not going to be a treat or a reward behind anymore. Um, whereas the lesion monkeys with the lesions were very inefficient at this task. So they just kind of kept going back to the same doors over and over and never put together that they've already gotten the reward from behind that door, go try another door. Okay, so a slightly different approach was taken when studying humans. There was development of an ingenious memory list for the order in which things have happened. Um, so recency memory. They were shown a long series of cards. Each had two stimulus items. There would be either words or pictures. On um, some cards, a question mark appeared between the items. My example here doesn't show that. I wasn't able to find the exact one that it's speaking of, but this one's pretty close. I think you can get the idea from looking at it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So either way, the subject's task is to indicate which of the two words or pictures, whichever one it is, which of the two they saw more recently. So successful performance would require you to recall the order that they were originally presented in. So here like apple, bird, car, or the arrows pointing the other way. So maybe it was card, bird, apple, regardless. Um, let's say it's car, bird, apple, and then you're shown the card with car and bird on it. Most recently, you would have seen bird, not car. Okay. So on most test trials, both of the items have appeared previously, but on some of the trials, one of the items is new. In this case, the task becomes that of simple recognition memory rather than recency memory. Um, and patients with frontal lobe lesions, they performed just fine on the you know, normal recognition trials, but they were impaired when it came to judging the relative recency between the two items, previously seen items. So, you know, with the top one, flower and bird, they could tell you like, oh, I saw I saw the word bird, like I have not seen the word flower. I don't recognize the word flower from this list before. But with car and bird, when they'd seen both of them, they couldn't tell you which one they saw most recently. Okay. The final major category of frontal lobe lesion symptoms is 
impaired social and sexual behavior, um, which involves pseudo depression, pseudo psychopathy, and deficits in social and sexual behavior. Um, social and sexual behaviors require flexible responses that are really dependent on contextual cues and frontal lobe lesions interfere with both of these. So an obvious um, effect would be you know, frontal lobe damage in humans is a marked change in social behavior as well as personality. Um, the most probably pub public example um, of personality change that relates to this is the case of Phineas Gage. I think we're all fairly familiar with this, but I'll run through his situation briefly just in case you know, anyone else's memory is a little like mine lately and a refresher does not hurt. So Phineas Gage was a dynamite worker who survived an explosion that blasted an iron tamping bar through the front of his head. After the accident, his behavior changed completely. Um, he had been average intelligence. He was quote unquote energetic and persistent in executing all of his plans of operation. Um, <clears throat> and then the same individual who described him in that way, after the accident, um, described him as you know, the equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities seems to have, have destroyed, been destroyed. Um, he said that he was fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanities, you know, manifesting um, but little deference to his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it came, um, you know, when it com conflicted with his own desires. He could be obstinate at times. Um, he devised many plans of operation, which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. Uh, he also stated a child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations, he has the animal passions of a strong man. So he, you could say he went through quite the change personality wise. Um, the autopsy, which was about a year after his accident revealed really deep scarring of the orbital part of both frontal lobes and more extensive on the right side, the right frontal lobe. Okay. So pseudo depression. Um, it's been consistently found that damage to the orbital frontal regions is associated with the more dramatic changes in personality than the dorsolateral regions, although you know, these have significant effects as well. But um, cl clinical descriptions of frontal lobe lesions effect on personality. Um, and few systematic studies have been conducted, but at least two types of person personality change have been clinically observed in these patients. So those classified as pseudo depressed will show symptoms such as, you know, outward apathy and indifference, loss of initiative, reduced sexual interest, little emotion, um, little, little or no verbal output. Those classified as pseudo psychopathic exhibit really immature behavior, a lack of restraint. They don't have much tact. Um, they use coarse language. They can be promiscuous in sexual behaviors, increased motor activity, just a general lack of social graces. So all of the elements of both pseudo depression and pseudo psychopathy are observable only after bilateral frontal lobe damage. Um, even so, you know, some elements of these two, they're, they're pretty different syndromes, right? So some elements can be observed in most, if not all people with unilateral frontal lobe lesions. 
um, but pseudo-depression appears most likely to follow lesions to the left frontal lobe, whereas pseudo-psychopathic behavior seems to follow lesions um, of the right frontal lobe. Okay. So changes in sexual behavior are among the most difficult symptoms of frontal lobe damage to document properly, uh, mainly because of like, historical social taboo against investigating people's sex lives. Um, however, orbitofrontal lesions can introduce abnormal sexual behavior such as you know, public masturbation or something like that because of reducing the inhibitions. Um, but the frequency of sexual behavior is not affected. On the other hand, dorsolateral lesions appear to reduce interest in sexual behavior altogether, although these patients are still capable of the necessary motor acts and they can perform sexually if you know, kind of led through the activity step by step. Um, also, social interactions. Uh, they're complex, right? It's, it takes a lot going on to interact appropriately in social situations. Um, it includes a lot of context-dependent behavior. Um, this can be seen with monkeys as well. So a monkey's behavior will typically change in relation to, you know, the nearest social group. However, they might lose that ability after frontal lobe lesions. Similarly, humans with orbitofrontal lesions might have difficulty understanding certain facial expressions, which would hinder their ability to behave in appropriate social manners. <clears throat> okay. So clinical neuropsychological assessment of frontal lobe damage. If you, Consider the number and variety of symptoms that, that we've talked about so far um, that are associated with frontal lobe damage. Um, surprisingly few standardized neuropsychological tests are useful for assessing these functions. Um, some symptoms of the frontal lobe injury, such as you know, loss of behavioral regulation they're not easily assessed by these types of tests. There are two test batteries that have been designed to measure these functions, the EXIT 25 and the frontal assessment battery. But this list here um, on the slide shows a number of clinical tests that you can use to assess for frontal lobe damage. It would be pretty rare for someone to perform normally on all of these tests if they'd suffered damage to either frontal lobe. Okay. So intelligence in the frontal lobes. Until fairly recently, um, it was thought that intelligence does not reside in the frontal lobes because large frontal injuries, including frontal Lobotomies have pretty little effect on intelligence um, as me measured by standard intelligence tests, but you know, for more than a century, psychologists have searched for other me measures of intelligence. So it's now that perhaps intelligence in the frontal lobes can be related to measurements other than IQ scores. So brain imaging studies link tests of fluid intelligence to a characteristic pattern of activity, both in the dorsolateral and medial prefrontal cortex and in the posterior parietal cortex. Um, so it's been argued that as our ancestors' brains enlarged, you know, greater metabolic demands were placed, placed a premium on identifying um, productive foraging you know, that might differ in food quality, volume, if there was danger in getting to the food. And so according to that, foraging strategies that supported reduced risk taking um, and hominid survival also selected for the superior problem solving capacities that then you know, evolved in humans and thus increased our intelligence. 
that all should have been with this slide. So we'll just quickly go over, actually a lot of that um, was meant for this slide. We'll go over um, fluid intelligence, which is the ability to see abstract relationships and draw logical inferences versus crystallized intelligence, which is retaining and using knowledge acquired through prior learning and experience. And then this is kind of just the chain that I went over. The reduced risk taking leads to survival, which leads to problem solving, which leads to increased intelligence. Okay. So a review of um, frontal lobe activation patterns associated with a broad range of different cognitive demands. So including you know, perception, response selection, executive functions, memory, so working memory, long-term memory, and problem solving. Um, this all found that if you're given such a diverse set of these cognitive functions, it would make sense to think that different frontal lobe regions are active as the different cognitive tests that require different cognitive functions are performed. However, it's actually been found that for most of these cognitive demands, um, there's a similar recruitment of dorsolateral, ventromedial, and anterior cingulate regions. So while these, you know, some regional specializations exist in the frontal lobes, an integrated network um, is really what's being utilized to solve this diverse set of cognitive problems. Basically, it's mainly those three regions working together to produce all of these behaviors listed here. Um, is these three you'll see over and over the same three, the um, dorsolateral, ventrilateral, orbitofrontal, frontal. So it's not like a one for one, like this function requires this area, this one requires this, as with a lot of the things in the brain we've learned about, they kind of all work together. Okay, so a few of the disorders affecting the frontal lobe we'll discuss are schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, Korsakoff syndrome, and prolonged stress. Also, um, addiction to drugs. So schizophrenia um, patients, they perform poorly on all tests of frontal lobe function and they exhibit abnormalities in eye movement control, but they perform normal on tests of parietal lobe function. In Parkinson's disease, um, so it results from a loss of dopamine cells in the midbrain, substantia nigra, and so also from the nigrostriatal pathway. Um, so while the cell's primary projection is to the caudate nucleus, they influence the prefrontal cortex indirectly through the caudate's projection to the dorsomedial nucleus of the thalamus. That was a word for, or a mouthful. <laughs> so basically, Parkinson's patients are characterized by a lack of facial expression similar to that seen in frontal lobe patients and they're impaired in the Wisconsin card sorting test we went over earlier and at the delayed response test that we talked about. Korsakoff syndrome. This is a metabolic disorder of the central nervous system associated with chronic alcoholism. Um, Korsakoff syndrome patients have alcohol induced damage to the dorsomedial thalamus they also perform poorly on the Wisconsin card sorting test, as well as tests of spatial memory and delayed response as well. Addiction to drugs. So it's classified as an inability to control drug seeking behavior despite aversive consequences. Um, that is kind of just the definition of drug addiction listed. So people addicted to drugs typically show impulse, impulsive or compulsive behavior or 
for separation, which are all symptoms that we've discussed so far of frontal lobe dysfunction. Um, results of studies with people addicted to drugs in decision-making tasks like gambling tasks we talked about earlier, they show impairments similar to orbitofrontal patients. And also imaging studies show impairments in orbitofrontal blood flow during acute withdrawal and even after long periods of abstinence. Um, let's see. Addictive drugs change the structure of neurons in both the orbitofrontal and medial prefrontal regions in rats. Um, so drug addiction is likely related to abnormalities in prefrontal structure and function that are associated with the maladaptive decision-making characteristic of addictive behavior. And then finally, prolonged stress. Um, it's correlated with significant changes in the structure of neurons in the prefrontal cortex that affect temporal memory and goal-directed behaviors. So also through a study with lab animals, we can kind of speculate that age-related decline in cognitive abilities could partly reflect the chronic effects of stress throughout a lifetime. And that is all I have on the frontal lobes. Um, we'll do a review in class on Thursday, um, likely a Kahoot to review, and then we can just go over if anyone had any questions about this or um, also feel free to shoot me an email. I'll, I'll look back over this before it gets posted, but I did pause it a couple of times. I hope that it continued recording smoothly and that the screen continued sharing, but if there does end up being any issues, just um, give me a call or send me an email and I will also send the um, PDF version of the slides that can maybe help follow along as well. All right, thanks and see y'all Thursday.